Having had an almost life-changing meeting with Jeffrey in 1996, which was partly what put him on his current career path, Vijay Jain, the speaker this evening, uh, has made making a synthesis of the work of these two people, whose architecture he admired so much, um, part of his life's work. But this is not just done in any old way, but is done with a clearly thought out manner, always working with artisans and craftsmen, striving to achieve the meticulous precision of thought in every detail that goes into Merkut's work, to surround spaces that relate to the landscape and to each other in what you see in the built forms and, uh, 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 and to the landscape and the context in which it is built with the sensuality and elegance that we all associate with Jeffrey's work. So I present to you to deliver the ninth Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture, Mr. Bijoy Jain. Channa, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> it's a real honor and a privilege to be standing here. Uh, I could never imagine that this opportunity would come my way. And I'm very thankful uh, for having the possibility of engaging in this way. Channa mentioned that I'd met Mr. Bauer in 1996. This was, I've been to Sri Lanka several times from the 70s. Uh, and I had the good fortune, it was, we were staying at the villa, you know, four friends, and uh, I was told that Mr. Bauer was going to be visiting, so I anxiously woke up that morning uh, in anticipation of his visit. And he arrived at 10, <clears throat> and I met him at the front door of the villa and introduced myself, I'm an architect, and at that point in time, uh, Mr. Bauer was working on a project uh, for my wife's sister, and so I just sort of introduced and introduced three other friends of mine who had nothing to do with architecture. And uh, while I was standing there, he had barely got out of his car and uh, looked at the gateposts that were being built. And sort of, you know, asked me, you know, what do you think of the proportion? <clears throat> and that completely, you know, uh, threw me, uh, took me by surprise. And I kind of mumbled, jumbled, you know, trying not to commit because I had absolutely no idea, you know, how to look at it. And then, you know, as we continue to speak, uh, a friend of mine uh, who was unabashed, you know, not knowing who Mr. Bauer was, you know, just barraged him with several questions about the villa and the way it was, and he sort of was amused, actually, and uh, we were fortunate to be invited uh, to Lunuganga later that evening for tea and cakes. Over tea and cakes, conversation continued, and uh, of course, I was very familiar with Lunuganga and the whole project, the trees, I studied the plans over the years and so I said I'd sort of take a small you know, walk because now I could see the real thing and be as part of the real thing. Anyway, I'm going to continue. So this is a workshop, uh, some more slides, uh, some more images of you know, just the space and a lot of the work is produced through making models. You know, we found that uh, this was the best way to communicate. I guess drawings, uh, models, you know, uh, paintings. Uh, objects, anything as a means of communication, tools of communication. But what was what was interesting was that this was universal. The language was quite universal, and it allowed several people to participate at the same time. So what I'm showing you are basically are working drawings. You know, these are conceptual models. Uh, the, these are artisans who are actually participating in the making, in the concept. You know, we can discuss you know ideas of space through thickness, density, mass. And they intuitively get it. I mean, there's a sort of intuitive, innate, you know, tacit understanding of this. This slide, what I like about it is this idea of postures in architecture. Uh, and I think, again, very prevalent in, in, in this region of uh, uh, the, the globe, you know, Sri Lanka, India, where we still sit down on the ground. Uh, but for me, it's interesting because this idea of, you know, uh, the question that I raise is that do traditions get lost maybe in the loss of postures? that if we lose postures, maybe some certain kinds of architecture, certain things uh, cannot be made anymore. You know, though the materials exist, more than the techniques exist, but it's all about, you know, taking a posture in the making of architecture and also the proximity in which these materials are made. You know, there's a certain sense of, of proximity that resonates in the process of making. So again, just sort of to give a brief background of, 
you know, how we try to approach what we, what we do and, you know, why we do it this way. Uh, again, it's interesting when you see the, all fours, you know, the hands and the feet all connect in the making of the object, where it's a total, complete uh, cycle of hand, body, and mind, uh, all engaged in making this thing. These are just what I was talking about, you know, models, uh, you know, very precisely done. So they also become their own entities, uh, their architecture by themselves, you know, without having to really build the whole thing. And they exist as objects unto themselves. And this is what we do, this is what they do, you know, from the initiation of the concept, you know, several things like these are continuously made, continuously made. And uh, the same people who make these models actually go to site and then construct the building. Uh, and they have a way to register the heights, uh, and it's sort of all, uh, it's all done on, on, on site, but also a lot through memory and all, a lot through practice. So this idea of practice, of making these things is very important. And that's the project. And the whole idea was to sort of slip these boxes, uh, these wooden boxes that suggested no, it wasn't conceived. When I first went to site, I'd imagined them to be these glowing lanterns, completely illogical. But that was the sort of inner voice, you know, this idea of a lantern that was suspended in the space. And I quite didn't really know how to get to it. And so it was just this exercise of surveying and, you know, uh, making marks. Uh, also, this idea of a hybrid, you know, uh, between the tradition and the development or, or, or the sort of industry, so this idea of a hybrid, and Chana talked about Glen Market and Jeffrey Bauer, because I, what I enjoyed is the romanticism, you know, this idea of, of space, the seamlessness, the ease uh, in which his projects sort of sit uh, and sort of, you know, just uh, observe uh, the, the landscape, and, and I think in, in, in a very sort of effortless, easy way, without asking you to commit to something. Uh, on the opposite side was Glenn Merkitt, you know, that I was also very fascinated by, and just the sheer precision in which he would go about making his buildings, you know, single-handedly, doggedly. And, you know, oftentimes I would think that what happened if these two mixed, if these two, two came together, would, was there a possibility of a third? Uh, and this was something sort of sitting in the back of my head. Anyway, it was not, uh, I wouldn't say it was conscious, but it was a thought that was there. Uh, so part of this dimension, actually, of these, these, these uh, wooden boxes comes from three sheets of plywood, which are four feet wide, four feet by eight feet, so it makes 12 feet. And then we found this optimum dimension, uh, what might seem as a as sort of array of trees without any logic. Uh, we found a dimension that resonated and sat comfortably uh, within the space left between the trees. So that's how we actually conceived uh, the, the project and the dimension for the project. Again, it's basically like a laundry, you know, it, the locals call it a laundry box, you know, uh, they call it a, you know, a mini bus, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, but the whole basis of the project was that it, it was just a volume of air that was trapped, you know, that was suspended in this, you know, wooden, uh, wooden frame structure. All the colors, uh, everything was inspired by what was actually on site. Uh, they had these beautiful irrigation channels that we continue to have, uh, and that was really the core, again, of the value of this project, where the structures at some point would, would uh, deteriorate in time in the, you know, 50, 100 years, and what would still remain is the sort of main spine, which was this irrigation channel. But the colors of the, the walls were inspired by the lichen on, 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 the, on the trees. Again, here what was interesting was this idea of what's inside and outside, and not necessarily that you need to see the outside, and again, for me, a discovery here was, uh, what was interesting was that the atmospheric air that is outside uh, and the air that is inside the building are actually identical. Uh, because there's actually, there's no glass, there's no screen, it's just these louvers and it sort of dissipates between the two. So while you're inside, you know, inside a covered space, you still get a sense of a very sort of strong presence of the outside. And when you move between the two, you don't, uh, experience the difference. We actually had to go back and make measured drawings. Uh, we had, uh, you know, the last year we had to publish uh, some work of ours and it took us five months to go back to a lot of projects and actually measure them uh, fairly accurately and, and draw them up. Till then we didn't really have drawings of these, these projects. 
again, just you know, the tests, the experiments, uh, to ensure that you know, no, they're not experiments. They're tested through time. Their their engineering is tested, and oftentimes we rely on each other's knowledge. Uh, we rely on uh, the physical experience that we see around us in, in our neighborhoods. And if we are able to span four meters, then we accept the four meter span, saying that we have confidence and we have the ability. And we believe that you know, good architecture or architecture or space can be produced with that limitation. So this idea of also being limited in many ways uh, for us actually works to an advantage because this way we have the ability and the control and we don't need to depend on an outside source. Yes, we do get it checked by the engineer uh, once we have conceived it, developed it, uh, just to get his nod off, uh, you know, his sign off. But to actually take full responsibility for the project in every single way. Uh, we also maintain these buildings. Uh, this one is now six, seven years old, and we go back every year and look after these buildings. So it's a process of care also that's very important uh, as part of uh, what we do. So this is just exercise, and you can see that's the clearing, that's the house. Uh, it's a courtyard house, and the whole idea of the courtyard was to release the anxiety of the site or the anxiety of the ground, because this floods in the monsoon, and it's sort of cutting a hole on a slab, so it sort of releases the water. Of course, it's higher up. And also this idea of holding the anxiety uh, of the site, because it's quite dense, you know, with mango trees and, and with the monsoons, you can actually hear the trees grow. They sort of come crawling at you, know, they come at you. You know, light is darker, it, it can sense to be uh, claustrophobic. So this idea of this aperture in the middle, uh, that is a space that actually is a place for, to hold the anxiety, to hold the anxiety of the site, to hold the anxiety of the people quality of the drawings of these carpenters over a period of time. Some of them have measurements, some don't. Uh, but just this is, this is a working drawing, so they have about 20 sketchbooks on this particular project. Again, you know, local inspiration, osmosis, uh, structures very similar that I've seen here in, in, in Sri Lanka and even driving down to Gaul, uh, many pictures that, that one has taken. So, I think where do these ideas come from? Where do where do memories lie? You know, they're all important, very important sort of ideas in thinking about what what makes us uh, create the things that we do. And I, I would say it's more like a monsoon house. It's a house for the rains because the moment the rains come in, it sort of dissolves and dissipates. The whole house sort of, in a sense, dissolves into uh, into the water. And this courtyard really is, is what absorbs this uh, season, I think. This was in construction, anyway. And, uh, again, here the tolerances are very tight, so that the, the space between outside and inside is only separated by seven inches. And you want, would wonder how do you manage this in the monsoon. But it's all a question of calibration. It's like the way we'd wear a raincoat or put, put, uh, put you know, the hood on our head. And it's a question of being, it's not about being uncomfortable or comfortable, but about being attentive to the climatic season, how to negotiate them, and what window do you keep open, and which one do you keep closed, and how do you adjust it. All that becomes part and parcel of this sort of living entity, uh, you know, the human and the, uh, the architecture that, that sort of forms an envelope. Uh, again, this rock was very recently put in uh, as a sense of actually absorbing and holding uh, uh, the water, sort of keeping the water pressed down, and it's a sort of uh, an odd condition because the stone would actually sink in water, but that's the suggestion of this rock that actually holds this entire project, holds the entire space, holds the entire you know, surroundings uh, that wrap it. So, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this lecture, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>